Okay, welcome back everybody for the last session. Today we have a panel. Um, actually, this is sort of the beginning the, of, of this idea for the conference um, is Mike and Jennifer and I were supposed to do a panel at South by Southwest um, about a month ago or so, um, I think. And obviously it got canceled, South by Southwest got canceled. And so we weren't able to do that. And so uh, this was the beginning of, of kind of ChatterComp and, and putting together a bunch of people to speak about uh, languages and language learning online while we're all at home. So uh, to remind you, if you you know have not been here for all five or six hours of this, uh, my name is Scott Chacon. Um, I'm the CEO of Chatterbug. It's a language learning company based in Berlin. Um, and I have with me Jennifer and Michael. Some of you have watched Jennifer uh, as well uh, earlier in the daytime. Um, so uh, Jennifer, can you introduce yourself very quickly? Sure. Um, my name is Jennifer Dorman. I'm an instructional designer at Babbel, which is a language learning app. If you had an opportunity to hear um, Jeff Stead, our CPO, speaking just before, you know a lot about Babbel. Um, but we are a Berlin-based uh, language company, a uh, full language ecosystem with podcasts and travel and um, Babbel for Business. And yeah, I love working there. And I'm also a linguist and a true language geek. So I'm super happy to chat with you guys today. And we also have uh, Michael. Michael, can you introduce yourself really quickly? Hey, I'm Mike Shankwan. I uh, am the CEO of Lingoda. Uh, we're also based in Berlin, Germany. And usually the first question I get asked is, what is um, an American with Chinese roots um, doing running a German company? Um, it's sort of like the best of my uh, best of all worlds for me, um, coming from the education tech space. Um, and being a polyglot and lang language geek myself, um, it's sort of uh, my homecoming. And uh, we do uh, live um, online classes um, with teachers. Uh, we offer four languages, English, German, French, and Spanish. Great. Um, and so the original idea for the South by Southwest talk was um, sort of, you know, we would talk about uh, technology in language education at South by Southwest EDU. Um, and so we had come up with sort of a list of questions to go through and do sort of a panel on. Um, and so look, I still have that list of questions. So um, we'll get started with that. I'll throw out uh, the questions and we can all sort of discuss them. And then if anybody has questions uh, in the audience at any time, um, it's kind of funny when we were first talking about this, we were trying to figure out how do we get questions from the audience. It turns out it's much easier in this format than it was <laughs> in real in person. Um, but if anybody in the audience has questions at any time, just throw them out and I'll try to introduce them uh, as we go forward. So um, I'm gonna start off with the question of, um, you know, we've had a lot of people talking today about how to learn a new language. Um, I think it's interesting to think a little bit about why should people learn a new language. Um, this conference has been entirely in English, um, but if you speak English, uh, which is sort of the lingua franca, you know, today in, in business and, and technology, why should you learn a new language? Maybe we'll start with uh, Jennifer. Sure. Um, well, first of all, when we talk about speaking a new language, obviously, we're talking about some different gradients as to what that means to be, say, fluent. At what level do you need um, to have um, a, a comfort level to say, I'm speaking this language? But ultimately, speaking another language is, uh, is opening a door, is to a door to a new culture, a new way of living, a new way of thinking. Um, that aside, plenty of great music and film and art that you can appreciate um, when you can enjoy it in its original language. And when we think about why languages are important to learn, I mean, we have you know these, these reasons that we tend to go to that it does provide us with access points um, to connect with other people, but also from an internal standpoint, speaking another language also provides us with things like that mental workout that we might want to go to. It also provides us with a lot of that discipline uh, when you're learning a new language and you are making the plans for learning and creating that sort of discipline and that habit that has really positive spillover effects. Um, I can literally say that I learned or learned Polish um, by virtue of actually deciding to start running every day. Um, and really it was discipline for 
wanting to learn Polish that got sort of piggybacked to running. And I will say that I'm a runner now, but my Polish is unfortunately not as good as I'd like it to be. And uh, what about you, Mike? Yeah, um, I think to build off what Jennifer said, um, I'll take it from a slightly different angle. Um, I actually think that learning a language, especially for people who are native English speakers, can make you a much more effective leader. Um, I think it actually makes you more self-aware of yourself, and it also makes you much more aware of others um, and their circumstances and how they see the world. Um, I've actually um, uh, have a relationship with um, a professor, uh, Tadal Neely, at Harvard Business School, who actually um, studied a lot the impact of English on multinational companies. Um, some of you might have heard about this. So she studied Rakuten, which is a multinational corporation based in Japan. Um, and she studied sort of the impact of Englishification of this multinational corporation. And there were three groups of people. There were um, the Japanese um, who um, had to speak English despite it being a Japanese company. There was um, a second group, which was um, English natives um, speaking English. Uh, so somebody like me or Jennifer. Um, and then the third type was um, other, call them non-English natives um, speaking English. So let's say a French person or Indonesian speaking English. Um, guess who of the three groups actually was by far the most effective communicator? It was actually um, group number three. So the Italians or the Indonesians who um, spoke another language but also uh, spoke English, they were actually the most effective communicators. Who do you think actually by far was the least effective communicator? It was group two. So the, uh, <laughs> uh, the, three, yes, the three of us, it just happens to be, we all happen to be um, English natives um, speaking English. Um, and, and so why am I actually bringing this out? Because um, it, it's, very, it's very interesting. It goes to the core to you know, why we do what we do, right? Which is that um, this idea of like being aware um, of the other and aware of yourself is that English natives speaking English, um, yeah, they... Um, Use a lot of colloquialisms. Um, they use a lot of idioms. English has a lot of words to express the same thing. Set complex structures, and so you basically lose people in the meaning, and they don't get what you're trying to say. And basically, you can't communicate and effectively lead people. By far, when you actually know two languages extremely well or more, you actually understand yourself a lot better and where you come from, as well as um, uh, where other people come from. And so. I actually think that that is actually a very good reason if you are not a language buff um, to study another language because it actually helps you to think differently and to empathize um, and to understand others. Yeah, I agree. Actually, it's it's funny. I, I thought at the end of that of, of um, an exercise that, that we did here around when my German was like B1 or something where we were trying to figure out a marketing thing. And so I would do it in English. Um, and then we found that it was actually fairly effective to do it in a language that you're not that good at because you simplify it so much, right? And, and it actually becomes much clearer. And we, I would just do it in German and then we translate that to English. And we we're like, oh, this is much more succinct <laughs> uh, than it was when I was trying to be clever about it. Um, uh, so the next question that I have is, um, so you, you decide to speak a new language, you start learning a new language. Um, can you talk a little bit about how learning a new language has changed your lives? Are we going to go in the same order, or yeah, actually, let's start with Jennifer. We'll, we'll we'll start with Jennifer. <laughs> okay. Um, the power. Well, actually, I would say what um, what you both mentioned a little bit about thinking about how you communicate in general. So, just across the board, what is the actual gist? of what you want to say? How do you distill your ideas down to the most essential, the most important um, ideas that you want to get across? That I think has really, I think very much changed the way I speak English. I mean, I've been in Germany now for nearly 10 years. Um, I learned German after arriving here. So it's not like this is a heritage language I've been speaking all along. And every time I speak with family and friends back home, especially when I am actually back in the States for a visit, people constantly remark at how I speak differently. Um, maybe not like pronunciation, but it could be the cadence, it could be my word choice. I also tend to take a little bit more time to think, even when I'm gonna respond in English, I tend to take that extra second 
Um, it's the same way that when you are, when you're having a conversation, maybe for all of us, we had a conversation in German, we would need to take just that extra split second to start to formulate the idea in our minds um, before we actually open our mouths and start speaking. Um, I find myself doing that with English now. Um, and incidentally, I'm also losing some of my English vocabulary and my, my it's not even Danglish, it's like dang French, Polish, Spanish. I don't even know what word we would use to describe um, the way I, I speak English. But um, ultimately, it, it's changed the way I think. It's changed the way I communicate. Um, but on a different side, it's also made me a lot more aware in general of cultural differences. Um, when you start to speak a language or learn a language where you have so, you know, the, the sort of the formal and the informal versions, and you have to think about what those sort of respect levels. So, you know, languages that are like a high distance language where you have like this very formal way of speaking. It's not just the word choice you use. It's also the way you interact with people. Um, and so that's been something that's that's also really different. Um, because we don't have that in English. Um, but when you learn languages that have that sort of distinction, um, it makes you think a little little bit differently. And I mean, I would also say, I'm thinking about what gender means. I mean, you, it's pretty easy in English um, to sort of de-gender a lot of words, um, but then in other languages, it, it's a lot more difficult. And then thinking about how that, what's conveyed when I use the feminine version of a noun or a pronoun versus the masculine version and that sort of thing. So it's made me be a lot more cognizant about my word choice and also how I change the messages that, um, or reframe my messages based on my speaking partners. What, and what about you, Mike? Yeah, I mean, very much actually what Jennifer said as well. And I'll just use slightly different examples to, um, to elucidate um, how it's changed um, my life. I mean, first and foremost is experiencing the world. So um, having a purpore of experiences from the very bizarre to the uplifting, um, traveling to many, many different countries, living in many different places around the world, um, it actually gives you a completely different lens um, into what the world is, what different cultures are like, um, and how you interact with them. And that I think, you know, is it speaks for itself. Um, off of Jennifer's point of just like, you know, sort of learning about others and how to flex to others. Um, you know, I think for me, um, I'll actually give a very um, specific example. Um, one of the things in, in thinking about um, uh, preparing for this panel is I was, I was thinking about like, you know, how in the, in, the, in the six languages that I know, like how they sort of differ and are similar in many ways. Um, and so one thing actually that I found really interesting is in the six languages that I know, there are like the languages that like interrupt um, or active speaking. And then there are like languages that are like, people tend to have, it's like a culture of active listening and waiting, I call them. And, and it actually is all, for example, in the position of the verbs. Now, why am I telling you all of this? I'll just, um, um, get to my point, which is that, so in something like English or Spanish, um, the verb always sits in the beginning, almost always, right? So something like Spanish, if you say querías, um, that's two past tense. Um, uh, which is I was liking, right? If you say no querías, that's basically the negation is all in the front and you say, no, you don't, you, you weren't liking. Um, whereas in something like Japanese, which fascinates me, the verb is always at the end. It's always the last thing that comes, right? It's not like German words sometimes. Um, that changes the way you look at life, basically, and the way you, you, you do everything. Um, and then the gate, uh, negation is also at the end. It sits at the end of the verb. Um, and so the joke um, that I used to always make with my Japanese friends is like, yeah, you can like basically change the whole meaning of a sentence, um, you know, after the 10 seconds that you actually speak the entire sentence, right? So why is that actually important? Because if you think about like this language is living in a Latin culture, right? There is a tendency for people to actively speak much more. And I actually found it sometimes, wow, this is a little bit too much for me. I haven't finished talking, right? But that's also part of the language because the verb is in the front. On the other hand, if you think with Japanese, having lived in um, lived in Japan, it's the exact opposite, right? So an American going to Japan will be like, whoa, like I've kind of said something and people kind of look at me and they kind of wait and they're still like, you know, are they going to respond or not, right? Like it's like the exact reverse because they're waiting for the verb and even then they're still like thinking about what you said. And so that actually for me is actually just, it's fascinating because it's like, 
ah, okay, just because of the way that the verb is placed and the way they've actually seen these different languages, it actually results in the culture being different. And having to think in those ways actually has led me to actually approach um, working with different cultures um, in a different way. Interesting. Actually, uh, I really kind of wanted to interrupt you in the middle of one of those sentences just for the joke of it. But um, I, <laughs> I, I, uh, I, you know, I agree. I think I, you know, for me, I've been learning German for a few years now. And for me, what's really interesting is it, it opening up um, the cultural door to, to sort of life experiences that you wouldn't otherwise have right now. Um, I sort of randomly made the decision to start studying German um, and it became the first uh, curriculum that, that Chatterbug had. Um, and it was a relatively random choice. And now, you know, I'm living in Berlin and uh, and, and most of my life is in Germany and in, in Berlin now. Um, and so obviously that wouldn't have happened if I had made a randomly different different choice. But obviously being able to, to or even not even be able to, being able to, to speak the language as I'm making mistakes in English, but not even just being able to speak the language, but um, the pursuit of that of that cultural knowledge, right, ha changes sort of the direction of, of your life, and I think makes it more interesting. And I think that's that's why a lot of people um, that are that are watching this or you know that have joined us today are interested in, in languages as well. Is not just because they need that skill set for something very specific. But because they want it to open up their world to to, to new experiences, or or um, or you know, open up their world in some way. So um, I find that a very interesting sort of aspect of learning a language is is what it op the doors that it opens to to what you're able to do and the types of ways that you that you think, um, and how every every language does it new, right? Um, so. Uh, you know, we all work for for these language learning companies. Um, Mike Lingoda has sort of human beings, right? That that that's the 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 crux of of the offering, right? Is that you're speaking to human beings and, and practicing that. Um, Jennifer, you know, Babel. I mean, we've heard a lot about Babel and sort of what Babel is doing, but um, it has a little bit less of sort of a, a human uh, interaction content to it. And, and Chatterbug is sort of in the middle, like we we kind of do both to some degree, um, and one of the things that that I you know hear a lot, or I have pe people ask me a lot, is about um, the role of learning new languages in as technology advances, right? Um, of of you know, are we almost at the point, or will we be at the point at, the, at some point in the future where we can have like a little device in our ear and and anybody speaking to us like it's sort of translated automatically, or like will there there be a need as we move forward? to learn languages um, from a practical standpoint. And I'm, I'm kind of curious from both of your perspectives, um, what you think about that. Can, we can start with Jennifer. Thanks. Um, well, it would be really interesting at some point, some sci-fi device or brain implant that automatically translates. Um, but I, I don't know that that would necessarily, even if we had something that advanced, that it would negate the desire or the need um, to learn languages. I mean, on the one hand, we, we already do have some transactional type support, right? I mean, you can take your you can take your mobile phone with you um, to most countries in the world, and as long as you have Google Translate downloaded and access to um, you know to internet or data, you can actually take pictures of words in other languages and do a quick translation. Um, you can even type something in your native language and have it translate, like actually play it um, for someone who is unable to understand what you're trying to say. Um, but that it, it, that's a really shallow understanding of communication, right? It, it's very transactional. Um, and it also removes, a, even when you're physically there with someone and you might have a device, it does sort of provide a little bit of a barrier to the human connection. And ultimately, languages are, I mean, they're, they're about, a, of course, they're about a way of communicating, but they're also about a way of being. And when you have that technology that interferes with that human to human connection, um, it, you don't have that, that rich experience. And I also think that when we're thinking about, you know, many, many years down the road, there are still things that are not as enjoyable 
in the translated version, or you can't necessarily, you don't appreciate it in the same way when you're just seeing or hearing a translation than if you can appreciate it in its original context. I mean, just think of something like poetry. In poetry, yes, you can translate and get the gist of, of a poem um, that is written in another language, but you, you lose a lot of the, the nuance, the beauty of the language itself. Um, in many ways, you know, I'm waxing a little poetic, but in many ways, language, it, language is art. Um, and we can convey a lot by the word choice we're, we're using and how we actually frame that. So I think we don't we won't see um, the technology um, negating or obviating the need for la learning languages. And I also don't think that we would see people say there's no reason for me to learn a language if I have this awesome like little implant or something that would automatically translate. I still think we'll see people doing that. But on the transactional level, maybe. And what about you, Mike? Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think there's always going to be advantages to learning a language. Um, they say that meaning is always lost in translation. Um, and I think that will always be the case, um, sometimes um, humorously, sometimes dangerously. Um, so I'll give two examples. One in terms of um, dangerously. Um, I'm a little bit older than probably a lot of people here. Um, but uh, in, an, in the 1990s, um, we um, had a trade conflict with Japan. America had a trade conflict with Japan. And we wanted, um, America wanted Japan to open its, its doors to our autos, our um, autos, cars. Um, and um, so George the, Bush the first goes over um, to Japan and tells the prime minister, open everything up for us, right? And the prime minister responds, um, so desu ka? Um, and so desu ka um, in Japanese can mean, it has like five, four or five different meanings. It can mean like confirmation, disagreement, or question. <laughs> so it basically can say yes, maybe, no, <laughs> all in the same, right? So basically what happened was that it was translated as yes, right? <laughs> He goes back, tells the American people, I did it, right? Um, and of course, that was not the case. The prime minister did not agree. But he was just accepting and understanding what was going on, confirming it. Um, and that basically caused a huge commotion when I was in high school where, like, you know, the Japanese are liars. They don't keep their promises, right? Um, and then, of course, George Bush had to kind of try to twist their arm to make that happen. All because of, like, one little translation, right? Um, humorously, I actually will use the example um, because all actually we happen to all be in uh, Germany. Um, is um, uh, there was uh, there used to be on Saturday Night Live. This is an American um, um, show um, called Dieter Sprockets, and in Dieter Sprockets, um, uh, Dieter, um, who's uh, played by uh, Michael Meyer, um, will always say they, they like dance around. They say. And then he always tells people to stop dancing by saying, you must stop dancing now. You must, okay? Why am I saying this? Because um, those of you who speak English and German know that actually must in English is very strong. And in German, it's actually softer. It's like you need to or you should, right? Um, and uh, most Germans, if you live in Germany long enough, will, will tell you, you must do something. Right in English, sounds a bit autocratic, you know, especially in a German accent. Um, but uh, the point is, is that it's actually a complete miss. And until I actually learned German for real on a B one B two level, I finally figured out that when everyone is running running around telling me I must do something, it's actually more of I should go or I need to go do something. Um, by contrast, um, with Japanese, um, must doesn't exist. Uh, it's Nakereba naranai, which is seven syllables, and it can't be translated, but it basically means it's a double negative. If you don't do it, if you do not do it, it is not becoming of you. Um, because must doesn't exist. <laughs> so when I think kind of uh, humorously, right, like, um, you know, don't like force upon a Japanese person to do that because actually they don't even know what must means. Um, so, you know, off of Jennifer's point, like when we think about you know, this loss in translation and actually this cultural element, it's hugely, hugely important, both in terms of it can be dangerous, but it can also be funny as well. Yeah, yeah, my my um, take on this as well is, is you know, I, I when I think about um, 
a technology, and this, this leads into the next question that I'll ask as well, um, but I think about how good can technology get, right? And I think in the case of translation, I believe that technology at the very high end of it can get as good as sort of a human being, a human translator, right? Sort of standing next to you. And I don't know if you've ever used a live translator, but it's actually a fairly poor experience. It's 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 not like understanding the language, right? There's, there's sort of a slowness to it. There's a difficulty. There's an awkwardness um, to to waiting, sort of to to hear the translation, and then uh, of course, like you're saying, there's a lot of things that are lost in translation, right? So I was at a conference at some point, and and there was a panel going on, and somebody was I had a translator, and they were telling me what was happening, a personal translator, right? Um, and they were telling me what was happening, and everybody laughs at something, and I'm like, what was funny? And they're like, it's there's no we don't have time, like <laughs> it's it's an old cultural reference that they that they made a joke about and like i'd have to tell you it was like i would have to i would have to give you the background on this television show that everybody watched 20 years ago in order to get the joke that just happened like it's it's not even worth translating right um and so i think you know from my perspective right to, if even if technology gets as good as a human being it's still not actually as good as as understanding the language um which leads to my next question about human beings and technology um, which is assuming that we all do want to learn languages and that there is this imperative to learn languages going forward um, and technology is getting better. Um, what do you see as as the, the, and we've had a lot of conversation about this today in all of the, the talks, right, of the role of human beings and the role of technology um, as technology gets better at understanding human speech or at, um, at, you know, being able to analyze sort of what we're doing. Do you think there's a point where, We'll be able to learn our language very well just by talking to, you know, our computers. Or do you think that human beings are always involved in this in this loop to some degree? Um, let's start with Jennifer. I think definitely human beings are clearly always um, involved. You, it doesn't matter how amazing the speech recognition uh, software is, or you know how fantastic the translations might be, even when they're like idiomatic type translations we're still going to need actual speaking partners because yet some people do learn languages because they just need to be able to read and write. Yeah, I mean, there's the, 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 the whole profession of, you know, Ubersetzer in Germany where, you know, you're not translating word for word, like in other words, while someone's speaking, but actually all you're doing is translating the written word. Um, and for that case, I mean, if you're limited really just to that, well, maybe you could learn that without actually having an awful lot of human interaction. Uh, but everything beyond that, at some point, you, you do need to have the actual speaking partner. You need to hear the actual voice, and not just a computer simulated voice, but you need to hear authentic, um, you know, authentic accents. You need to hear the cadence. You need to hear the intonation. You need to hear how the the, the rise and fall of the the statement, the phrase, the sentence, how that conveys a lot of additional meaning beyond just the the word for word. Um, so I don't think that humans are irreplaceable in the process, um, not from the perspective of, you know, learning. And keep in mind, I also am pretty broad about this idea of like, you know, human teachers, because ultimately when someone is on their language learning journey, they're pulling teachers from all over. So the, the cashier you speak with when you're at the supermarket can can be a teacher. That interaction can teach you something. Um, and then of course you have you know formal type um, situations. So I tend to be pretty liberal when I look at that and think about all of the different types of inputs that can enrich the, the learning experience and that you can draw information from. So humans are not out of the equation. What about uh, you, Michael? Yeah, I would agree with that. I think that to add on it, um, I think that actually technology will very much enhance the human experience. Um, so we're even seeing this now that how, you know, having this virtual conference with over 500 people from around the world is absolutely phenomenal. And that's actually done simply by video technology and broadband. We couldn't have done that before without technology. So I think technology will actually um, very much enhance the experience. I do actually think for, you know, with companies like um, um, Jennifer's Bobble, like we will actually, um, I think at a, at, a, at a more basic level, like if you think A0, A1, I think you can get pretty far um, on some of the basics of a language. Um, how to say the the simple things, um, some of the basic grammar, um, sentence structure. Um, I think I think you can actually do that um, without a human experience. 
But I do believe that if you are going to master language and, and master some and learn some of the nuances um, of which um, the three of us have been talking a little bit about, is that like the human experience is actually an inevitable because at the end of the day, like language is actually is about human connection and it's about culture. And a lot of those details um, in vocabulary, colloquialisms, how things are said in their intonation, um, they actually ultimately require a human. So um, uh, um, a robot or technology could never, never replace that. But I think what's really exciting is that technology can actually make this a lot better and to help the complement the human experience um, so that um, the human classroom experience or human live experience, plus using all the technology um, that we have will actually make it even better and easier um, to learn a language in the future. Yeah, I've 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 actually seen both sides of this from you know Mangoda is probably similar, but um, I've seen both sides of this from having language like live language tutors that that people are, are speaking with as a central part of the product that we, that we offer. In that in the very early days, it's it can be really problematic because people don't feel confident and they don't really want to start talking to somebody. It's very scary, right? Whereas speaking to a robot that's not really going to judge you um, and that that you can mess up in front of and it's, it's not really going to care, right? It's sort of this heartless thing, but it's very intelligent. And so, you know, you can use it to, to sort of improve until you feel more confidence. Um, and so that's that's sort of a downside for the product that we're offering, since that's that's a lot of what we're doing, right? Is connecting people to, to tutors. Um, and then on the other side, we we see the opposite in the later stages as well. That that if you feel like not studying that day, um, then it's much harder to say no to a tutor that you've booked, right? Because it's like there's a human being waiting. Where you can tell a robot, you know, at a, you know what? I'm not. Again, it doesn't judge you really, right? Or I mean, sometimes depending on the app, it'll it'll pop up with a thing and judge you. But um, but you know, it, it, there is something about having a human there that just knowing that they're a human that you're letting somebody down. That's that's not a robot. I think that can be very motivating for people in a way that that even if the interaction can be very similar, or you can learn grammatically, or you can learn you know uh, colloquialisms or context or or whatever. Um, with a with with a uh, with a machine or an AI or something, there's still something about that human element of it that I think is motivating for people to not want to let down um, or or to uh, to get feedback from. So um, I find that I find that really interesting. And sort of talking about that that um, that area, right? Of of how of learning with with uh, technology and learning with human beings and some combination of them. Um, we have a lot of people. I think in the audience that are learning languages or are going through the process of learning languages. And we've heard about all of these technologies, you know, that of tandems or um, readings and podcasts and everything. I'm curious from both of your perspectives of learning languages, what do you think, like all of our products aside and all of the products that everybody's sort of talked about today, what do you think is the, the best way to learn a language? Like, what do you think is sort of ideal right um, now and, and sort of in the future? Like how, how do you see this, this, like all things being equal, what would be almost the perfect way to 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 learn a language for for you? Let's start with Jennifer. I mean, it's a tough question because every what's perfect for me is probably not perfect for Mike or for you, uh, Scott. So one of the things that we have to remember, and this is actually the the advantage of where we are right now in terms of technology, what's out there in the market uh, for language learners, is that there's a wide variety. Uh, of different different types of experiences. And if to answer this broadly, I would say what's what's the perfect setup uh, for a language learner is finding those tools and those resources that fit into their day. Um, because that's one thing that's a little bit different from the way adults learn and the way children learn. I mean, children, we can send them off to school and they don't really have much choice and they're going to go through you know, their classes because they have no choice. They're sort of a captive audience. But for adults, you know, we, we, have a lot, we have a lot of other things going on. And so if we can find a, a system or if we can create a system, you know, sort of systematic plan um, with the tools and resources that fit into our day, that allow learning to become a way of life, so to become a habit, then that's the perfect setup. Um, because ultimately, when we 
try something that doesn't quite fit with our day. So if I signed up for, and I'll use, I'm gonna throw my husband under the bus here, but he signed, he wanted to learn Polish. He signed up for a class at the Volkshochschule in Munich. And he thought this is going to force me to learn Polish, right? Because I, I paid for it. So um, I have the class, I know when I have to go there, I bought the books. Um, and he lasted a couple of weeks. Why? Because it didn't fit into his daily routine. It was a Monday night. Um, he was a teacher. So at the end of his <laughs> a Monday full of students and questions, then he was going to go and have a 90 minute Polish lesson. Um, it just didn't fit. Um, but he was able to find other resources, including some friends that were willing to speak Polish with him. Um, there's a language learning app that offers Polish <laughs> through different lessons. And he was able to um, create a habit or a routine of putting that into his day. So I think really what's perfect is finding the things that you enjoy doing that make that make learning um, a joyful experience for you that you have fun with um, and that you can incorporate in your daily routine and have that fit um, with what your expectations are of learning and what your day actually you know, constrains in terms of when you can do this. And what about you, Michael? Yeah, I, I fully agree with that. I, I would actually take half a step back and say, um, although it's not a reality for a lot of us, a lot of the time um, is, you know, 100% immersion 24 um, seven, you know, go to the country, live in the country. Um, and all you do is speak that language. And it just uh, no worries, like, outcomes your mouth all the time, just speaking, speaking, speaking. That is not, of course, a reality for most of us. Um, so um, off of Jennifer, to build off of Jennifer's points, if I said, okay, great, I have, want to learn Polish, but you know, I'm got a full-time job and I don't live in Poland. What can I actually do? Um, you know, first thing she said was, you know, make it a habit. Absolutely. Um, and I think it's a little bit like playing the piano or tennis. So it might be really hard to go to the Polish lesson, the first, um, you know, four to eight weeks. Um, but after a while, you actually develop a rhythm of 7 p.m. Um, on Fridays, whatever it is, then you really kind of built that habit. And once you have it, it's like, okay, you don't even think about it anymore. That's number one. Um, I think number two is, um, I call it, um, we call it Lingoda, like um, language um, flexibility. Um, and so I think it's actually important to, and this is contrary to what offline language schools mostly do, um, which is that you need to speak and learn from as many native speakers as you can. Um, if you just keep speaking to Scott over and over and over again, you're going to know how Scott speaks English, but you're not going to know how anybody else speaks. And by the way, there's a, 10 different versions of English or however many there are. Um, and the cadence of a man versus a woman, a young person versus an old person, different accents, uh, ways people use the language, completely different. So you got to build language flexibility or it, it's, it's limited. So speaking to a lot of different people. Um, I think the third thing is, is like, I think structure is actually really good. So structured curriculum, I think in any days, like we're human beings. And although we like flexibility, it's like lesson one, do this. Now do the homework, right? Now do this. Um, very, very important. Um, so I think, you know, um, all three of us, we actually have our structured curriculums. It's very important to, to, to have um, a course like that in mind. Um, and then last, I would say, I've actually learned this um, over time with learning German recently is so situational learning. Like if you can like use it immediately, or if you know you're going to go into a situation right afterwards, that's the best way to actually um, like get it in your mind. So I'll be specific. Um, hmm, I got to open a bank account. I actually, what I did in my first year in Germany was I asked for a private class and I learned about all the different words and things that I might say as it re relates to being in a bank or finance. Um, you know what? Prior to that, I couldn't, I wouldn't be able to string two words together um, on how to open a bank account, but I did that. And then two hours later, went to the bank to open it. And I was like, so proud of myself. And those words actually stuck in my mind as a result. So situational learning is actually um, very, um, uh, very, very helpful in learning the language. Yeah, that's, it's sort of like a, like project-based learning or something, right? Like, like having, having a goal that you know that you need to do, and then you're not, you're not memorizing words for the sake of memorizing 10 more words or something, right? You're memorizing to a tool set, you're, you're building a tool set that you need to construct to complete a task. Um, and that, I think that that's something that's, that's very compelling, um, in learning and, and I, you know, I agree. I, I think that, that 
it's interesting to me sort of what the the combination of, of sort of human and, and technology is like what we've found is that it's really valuable to try to meet people where they are right and and i think you know running products like we all kind of see where our product does and doesn't meet different different students um, at points that they expect but like we, there's this is actually one of the more difficult things about trying to build a product that you're using all the time too, right? Is that if you're if you're really focused on on doing well in this thing and then you move past that and then you're like, oh, it should change to meet me where I am now. And all of our motivations and all of our, um, you know, what is effective to us, I think changes over the course of our language learning journey. And it's it's kind of difficult to, to piece all of that together. Um, so I, I did actually have a, a question from the audience as well that I wanted to bring up while, while we were kind of on this topic which was about um, where it's not meeting you, right? Uh, as in your language learning journey to some degree. Um, and, and it references what Steve said earlier, Steve Kaufman said that a big challenge was, was getting intermediate material and making this leap in this sort of desert that he was calling it between sort of the B levels and the C levels, right? Of, of um, that that's what he finds is this very difficult challenge in in not getting stuck in this desert in in each language that he's learning. I'm curious what a what you guys find uh, as a big stopping point or difficulty or the biggest challenge when you're learning a language, and then also if you can maybe what you've learned from your students um, over the years of of what you see them struggling with. Uh, Jennifer. Um. So for me, it. it Personally, it's, it has a lot to do with ego um, in the sense that I need to, my threshold for how confident I need to feel before I'm ready to put myself out there and try to actually speak this language um, that I'm learning with other, you know, with native speakers, um, my threshold is pretty high. Um, so theoretically, I could, all, I could get all the way up through B2, even C1, reading and writing and getting things right, and I still might not have the confidence to want to actually use the language. So for me, it's overcoming that, you know, kind of an adult sort of thing where we re really have a fear of failure or a fear of, of looking foolish um, or thinking that people are going to laugh at us. And that's, for me, that's the biggest challenge on a personal level. Um, and I have, you know, we hear that a lot from our from our students, um, and and you see that also a little bit just in terms of the the behavior that we see um, from people that are using Babel, where they have the opportunity to use the speech recognition, and sometimes they're turning it off. Um, so they're even even though the even though the robot's not going to be judging them, well, maybe judging them a little bit and giving them some feedback. Um, sometimes even their confidence level in that safe space of them and the app. Um, is even something uh, challenging to overcome. So I, I, I think, you know, feeling confident enough um, to put ourselves out there and, and actually use a language, as Mike said, I mean, it's, you have to use it, you have to speak it. The language, a language is about communicating. And so you have to actually put it to use in the real world with real people. Um, and it's sometimes a tough hurdle to get yourself um, confident enough to do that. Yeah. Um yeah, to build off of that, I, I think, you know, what Steve said is absolutely right. Um, I didn't actually think about this that much, but I think the the move from B1 to C1 um, is very difficult. Um, and it's a very difficult to keep as well, even if you, if you get to a C1 to actually maintain it. Um, you know, I think simply just the amount of vocabulary that you have to learn um, and retain and keep is like, wow, holy cow, right? Um, and I... Um, so I actually say like, I don't think there's, I actually I'm gonna say it an answer which just doesn't sound, this doesn't sound great. It's basically, you have to live in the country, you have to work in the environment, uh, a partner, um, kids who speak it, um, your family, um, and you have to practice it all the time. Otherwise, I actually think it's very hard to move from, um, from the B levels to the C levels. Um, and um, it's interesting when I was, um, uh, so I don't, I, I don't speak every single one of my languages um, at a C level. I wish I did. Um, but the ones I actually speak at a C level are exactly the ones where I've actually lived in the country. Um, and um, they always say that, uh, you know, I, I've taken some of these language exams um, at the C level. And they always say, I took it for Spanish um, a few years ago. And um, they told me that basically, yeah, nobody actually passes the C exams um, unless they actually lived in a Spanish speaking country for um if not one year um at least two years 
Um, and that was the case for me. I'm not going to tell you that I just sort of magically it just inhaled it, right? Like through talent. It honestly was through perse uh, perseverance and actually being in that environment day in and day out and really working at it and getting there. So I, I think that, that that for me is actually the, the, the really the only way you can get from a, a real B1 to a C1 and actually to maintain the C1. Yeah, yeah I've, I've actually found that as well. I mean, you know, I, I have been learning German for, for a few years now since, since sort of the beginning of, of Chatterbug and I moved very quickly, I think, you know, because I was I was really trying out everything very intensively at the beginning and I got to sort of the the B2 area and I'm comfortable in enough in sort of the interactions that I'm in even living in Berlin most of the time right um, that it's very difficult to kind of cross that 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 threshold I tried speaking with my partner um, in German being like okay we're gonna do German day or German week or something like that and it lasts for a little while and then she forgets and then we regress the English and it, we just kind of forget about it um, but you're you're right like it, it it becomes difficult to kind of unless there's this need sort of pushing you which um, uh, kind of goes to my next question which is you know there's a lot of people trying to learn languages here interested in that in that process um, where do you see people that have good intentions coming into language learning you know process um, where do you see them falling off? Like, like, or failing if, if they if they end up not being able to really become proficient in the language, like, um, are there pitfalls to to watch out for that you think that that people run into a lot that that you know if you have some some awareness of it beforehand, uh, maybe you can prepare to to avoid. Um, uh, Jennifer, I mean, I, I think part of it comes just from having some realistic expectations when you start out. I mean, you hear some people say, oh, I'm going to be going on holiday to Mexico and I want to speak, you know, I want to be speaking fluently with, with everyone on the beach. Um, I'm leaving in three weeks and I don't speak any Spanish now. So this idea of, you know, it, it's great to have this, this end goal, this image of what, what you want to be and where you want to be using this language, um, but it has, it has to be realistic. And I think for some people, um, they don't, they have, they're a little bit overconfident sometimes and they set this goal and then they set, you know, they say, well, I'll do X, Y, and Z. But what they don't realize is that they're, they're not actually spending enough time. I mean, some of the speakers here today talked about that. I mean, take two years and spend an hour a day and that will get you, you know, relatively, you know, at a, at a level of fluency that you're comfortable with. But if you shorten that time, you need to, you know, in other words, for when you want to achieve that language goal, then you need to increase the effort and time on a daily basis to get there. And not everyone does that. And so I think we get a lot of people who get demo demotivated pretty quickly because the goal that they've set is either too, too big, too broad, um, there's too many decision points along the way where they can be distracted by any other in, any other thing, and they sometimes, you know, think, well, I guess I didn't do so well. I tried it before, didn't work. Then I guess I'm just I'm just I'm just not good at learning languages or something like that. Um, so I think it's you know approaching it from the perspective of this is realistic, um, this is what I want to do. It's aspirational but yet achievable. And then how do I want to get there? And then actually really kind of setting a plan without it, without a plan in place, just sort of, you know, I'm just going to listen to podcasts or listen to, you know, like a, you know, Spanish radio station that will get me there. That's, that's not probably a truly realistic expectation. So the achievable um, end result, the achievable outcome, and then the plan to get there when those things are not necessarily in place, then you can see a lot of people getting demotivated, dropping out and, um, honestly having a bad experience. So the next time they try to pick up a language, they now have this baggage, this extra baggage um, that they have to shed or overcome. Yeah, yeah I, I, to add it to that, I think um, one thing actually very specifically I've done both ways, um, which is um, listen, like always um, like doing everything in the language from day one versus, um, versus translating. So, a very simple example is if you listen to the news in Spanish um, um, or you, you're talking to somebody in Spanish and um, you say something, they say something, you have to translate it. Then you have to translate what you're going to say and then you say it. That's like four steps um, versus if you actually just think in the language from day one. And this is the difference between good material um, and um, 
to me, so, so this is my point of view, so, so material and a good teacher versus a so, so teacher, which is that they can get you from day one to always be like listening and thinking in that language. It's going to be much better for you long term if you always have to struggle to say, oh, my God, the verbs at the end. Like, right. So um, so I think I think that actually is incredibly important. The other thing that Jennifer alluded to is, you know, like language is like learning is like um, it's like learning the piano or tennis. Right. So um, you need um, you need perseverance and you need grit. You need to think long term. You need to think, OK, midterm kind of like what are my short term goals to get there? But by the way. Doing one week of it is not necessarily going to, you're not going to be able to suddenly be able to do this, right? You're going to kind of go up and down, up and down, up and down, like with tennis. And one day you will discover after grit and perseverance, oh my God, I really got better. Like what, how did that happen, right? But it's not going to just come like um, after one day or after two days. So I think it's really important to think that. Um, and it's also important, Jennifer said this earlier about like, you know, I think Scott, you said this too, about like ego, right? So like, you just have to, and I have this problem too, um, you know, I have this big ego and like, it has to come out perfect, right? Um, I can't just sort of go there and not think about it beforehand and just start speaking and not worry about the mistakes and all that, right? I think like ego, you, you kind of have to put that aside and just like, you know, let it out like the way a kid does, right? And kid makes mistakes, but that's okay. Like over time, you actually learn. Um, and if people understand you, that's more important than the fact that you spoke something perfectly. Yeah, <clears throat> yeah, I agree. I, I actually, I, I, I think one interesting thing that comes out of both of those is is expectation management, which I was also kind of talking about in in the first uh, in the first talk of the day, right? Of this is part of the reason why I think that my my German learning stalled. Well, a because you know I've, I've been trying to use my own product and. And uh, we end at the B2 curriculum right now. And so we kind of got to the end of the curriculum. And then I was like, do I start another language? But I'm living in Germany. And so, um, but but for everything before that, I had a very specific plan, right? It's like, okay, I'm going to do B1 by this length, by this date, right? And then you, you have this goal and you work out, okay, how much do you need to do per day to get in the hours to hit that goal? And then you start getting into it and you create a habit and then you get there. Like you always get there, right? And And then get to the sort of the end of B, B2 and it's like, okay, I'll work on C stuff, but it's very vague, right? And and I didn't even learn, like I know better than this as well, right? Of, of okay, I want to, and people have been talking about uh, the tests, right? Of doing C for tests or tough tests or something and, and saying, well, you know, that's not really the most important thing. Um, but for me, it's not, I, I think it is important in having a goal, right? Like it's actually pretty nice to be like, I'm going to pass this test, not because the test is necessarily important, but because it gives me a goal, right? It gives me something that the, the date that I have to do something and something to look forward to. And I think if you have that, that really helps with your motivation as well of being like, okay, I'm, I'm going to have to go in and speak to these, you know, people that are going to judge me and give me a, tell me whether I passed the, the test or not. So I might as well, you know, put in the, the time to do that. And, and I think that that's, that's very, very important, right? To have a, a goal of some sort um, and, and to try to work towards that goal. Um, okay, so we're getting towards the end of, of the time here. Um, we do have a, one more question in the, the, the event chat, which I'll read out and then uh, maybe do some clo closing thoughts and, uh, and, and I'll say thank you. So, um, Let's see. The question is, how do you see language learning technology impacting multilingual, uh, multicultural parenting, especially with so many parents at home with their kids now? Um, so this is interesting to me. I'll actually start this. Um, it's interesting to me because my daughter is 10 and has gone to French school since she was five, since Grand Section, but kindergarten, essentially. Um, and has always done school in French, right? And and neither uh, of her parents speak French, and and like that wasn't really a, a thing. But we, I wanted her to, to learn French, and so we just sort of put her in this school because I didn't want to go through the language learning technology. It's like this is the easy way of doing it of just you know throwing her in an environment where she needs to learn French and keeping her there for five years, and and it works, right? That's it's actually a fairly effective way of doing things because she doesn't like you were saying she doesn't really have um, a choice. Um, but I am, I am, I, it's been interesting to me not speaking the language and seeing her pick it up and be, you know, comfortable with it. It stressed her out for a little while and then kind of becoming comfortable with it. And now she has this tool set and this, this sort of open, you know, this, this worldview of this French world 
um, that she's been educated in for a while. I, I am curious if you guys have have um, thoughts around this as well of 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 you know multicultural parenting. Like for me, it's it's interesting going to sort of events at her school or whatever because the the even in America, it's a French school in America, but the way that people think about raising children or or whatever it's it's a little bit different than the way that americans think about it right the, the way that that french or sort of the global european community um raises children and so i i'm curious if you have thoughts around that as well uh jennifer uh, sure I, I mean i can give a i can give some personal um, insight from my own family um and kind of contrast this a little bit I, my the first language i spoke was french actually um, I don't speak French very well today. I have really good passive understanding, but that's about it. Um, but that's because when I was uh, when I was a child in the mid 1970s in New England, the pediatrician flat out told my parents, "Stop speaking French because she's going to have a French accent, and it's going to make the teachers think she's not as smart, and she's going to have limited, um, you know, limited opportunity when she starts working and has this French accent um, in her English." So they stopped speaking. French to me entirely when I was about four years old, just English from then. Um, I regret that and my parents regret that now. But today I have two nieces um, and my my brother-in-law is an American. Um, my sister-in-law is from Mexico and my two nieces have been raised completely bilingual. And one of the things that's that's pretty interesting is yes, there are cultural differences and there's a lot of, you know, so cultural um, understanding, um, but the, concept of being bilingual is seen today as a as an advantage and makes people it's all, and especially coming from the USA it's almost like a superpower and people really see that as something to be proud of so you know there's a celebration of that and recently um, I mean Babel you know gave students um, free free access um, during this this time period when they're learning from home and stuff like that and I've actually gotten messages from my nieces talking about how they're actually learning French with Babel, with mom, and Spanish with Babel, with dad. Um, so that's a, that's a really cool experience. So I, I think that, you know, technology maybe provides also that little bit of extra incentive um, because it can be super engaging, of course, and the younger set tends to be engaged a little bit more maybe with technology um, than adults. So we might see that um, continuing on, so. And Michael? I mean, yeah, Scott, I think it's the best gift you could give your child, um, really. Um, I, I grew up bilingual, um, Chinese at home, and then, of course, English, um, you know, in school. And I think across so many different dimensions, um, they do studies, but there's, is it conclusive or not, right? Like, um, you know, when I picked up my next foreign language, which was French, like, like it just sort of hopped. Like I literally like learned it um, twice as fast without trying as as other people um, and as other kids in the classroom. Um, and I think it sort of, I think it has very good. Um, I think it does a lot of great things for your brain in terms of creativity and looking at the world in a different way. Um, and then there's the whole multicultural element, which we have talked a lot about today. Um, I have seen also um, many eager beater parents when talking about you know raising kids of like. You know, okay, so you speak English, you speak French, and then they're going to learn like Japanese in class, right? <laughs> and so I, th I think that's great. I, I think as a polyglot, like that, that makes my mouth salivate. Um, um, you know, is it necessary to go to that degree? Okay, maybe not. But, um, but I think that, um, you know, having two parents and having, um, I've heard seen very, I, I've heard success is basically one parent speaks one language and one parent speaks another language. We have a lot of multicultural uh, families here in, in Berlin, Germany, which I, I just think is like awesome. I think that's great. I think that's the, you know, I think it's the right balance. I think that that kid will grow up with so many different things um, that uh, a, a monolingual um, kid would not. Um, and so I think, I think it's the best thing you can do as, as somebody who's actually, um, um, been able to take advantage of that. Great. And nothing you can do through technology, like technology can never, like that could never, you couldn't like kind of put a little like technology gadget, um, onto the kid and try to like get them to, you know, that's always, that's always going to be through the human connection and through the parents and through, you know, early childhood, um, discovery. Great. Um, okay, so we're we're at the end of our time. I'd I'd like to maybe just if you guys have final thoughts, um, either on on language learning or or tips or something, 
Um, I'd love to hear it and then we'll we'll wrap up. Maybe we can uh, start with Jennifer. Yeah, I'll make it super quick, um, but I, I think it's, it's never too late um, to start learning a language. It's a rewarding and enriching experience. And with so many opportunities out there, so many different methods, you're bound to find a, a method that, that works for you and helps get you to that language learning goal. Great, Michael. Yeah, I think that um, language gets more and more exciting with um, taking the best of people and technology. It's something that um, we're trying to do, uh, we are doing at Lingoda, so using humans, but also using technology and making it a better experience. I think that it gets really, really exciting when virtual reality comes around. So imagine um, learning French um, from a Parisian cafe and how to order a coffee, right, with the Eiffel Tower in the background. Um, I sounds, you know, I think it's I'm salivating at that. Um, and, um, and yeah, I think I would encourage everybody to um, learn more than one language if you can, um, because I think it also just, there's sort of different facets of a language. And I encourage you to actually learn a language that's really, really different and not think of it as hard, but think of it as different um, from your native language. Um, so go farther away, because I think the farther you go, um, the more, like, I think the more things you will actually learn and see the world in a different way. I agree. <clears throat> All right. Um, thank you both so much. Uh, I'm a little bit sad that we didn't get to do this in Austin. Um, I had plans to take you guys line dancing uh, and have some queso <laughs> and whatnot. Um, and there, there is a really nice karaoke joint there um, that, that I that I've been to waiting before. Waiting for so. time to finish so we can all do karaoke together. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, in in Berlin as well. Yeah. Um, yeah. So again, thank you so much. Uh, th this was a pleasure and um, I really appreciate you guys taking the time out of your day to do this. And I'm glad that we did get to do the panel after all uh, viruses notwithstanding. So um, thank you so much. And then I'll just kind of wrap up. Th this was the last talk of the day. Um, we had uh, several hundred people joining us throughout the day for, for uh, what has it been? Six, over six hours now. Um, it's been a, a very long day <laughs> for me, uh, watching everything and, and participating in everything. But um, anyways, thank you everybody that has joined us tonight uh, or today over the course of the day, morning, you know, um, depending on where you are, um, for talking about language learning. And um, thank you to all of the guests that uh, have come on and given a talk and, and given their time. Um, it's great to have this wonderful community of, of people building very different products for the same goal, right? Which is, which is learning a new language, opening up uh, people's lives to new experiences and new cultures. Um, and and we're all kind of you know competitors to some degree, but I think we all really care about people learning languages. And it's been fascinating to have everybody uh, talk um, about things that they care about so much and and uh, give so much of their time and, and energy to helping everybody learn languages. So um, my thank you to all the speakers, my thank you to the panel, and my thank you to the audience. Um, thank you for joining us. And uh, hopefully we'll see you maybe next year. <laughs> Thanks, Michael. Thank you, Jennifer. Thanks a lot. Thank you guys. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.